everybody. How's it going? Welcome to the show. Uh, this episode, we're a little bit different. Um, Todd Cochran over at Geek News Central is uh, on a much-deserved vacation. And uh, so this is for, for those of you who are listening to uh, Geek News Central or watching Geek News Central. Uh, this is Geek News Central episode number 962. Uh, for those of you who are in my Geekinator audience... Uh, this will be uh, the Geekinator episode number eight of season seven. Um, it's a little bit different because I'm kind of doing both shows at the same time. So uh, for those of you who are, are listening or watching the Geek News Central, uh, quick little fill in. Like I said, Todd's on a quick vacation. I'm your host, Adrian, coming to you almost live from Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC3. And uh, for those of you who are uh, in the Geekinator audience, you all know who I am. We've been... Uh, watching and listening to each other for a long time. I originally was going to record, I volunteered to record uh, uh, Geek News Central for Todd while he was on vacation this Monday evening, and I was originally planning to record uh, the Geekinator um, episode 8 of season 7, Friday night, the, the night I usually record it, but it was 4th of July, and... <laughs> Everybody in the neighborhood was doing fireworks, and it was, I just finally, I gave up, and uh, I was going to do it again, uh, or attempt to record it again Saturday, but, you know, it was holiday weekend, had a lot of family going on, and uh, just said, you know what, I am I have to do the show for Todd on Monday evening, and I'm probably going to be recording a lot of the same stuff, talking about a lot of the same stuff as I'd be doing for Geek News Central. So why don't I kind of do a simulcast, if you will, and uh, record uh, his show and my show uh, uh, at the same time. So for those of you who are watching and listening, if you're, if you're primarily Geek News Central, um, this will be a little bit shorter than what Todd usually does. And for those of you who are uh, listening and or watching uh, or in the audience for The Geekinator, this will be a slightly longer show than what you're accustomed to. It won't be dramatically longer, um, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and cover more than I usually do. Usually for the Geekinator, I go and blast through and episodes are 10 to 15 minutes. This will be a little bit longer than that. Um, I'll try to push it out to 20 minutes or so. You can probably hear in the background, I've got, like I said, there's a bunch of family going on. We're still kind of on the tail end of the holiday weekend. So I've asked them to try to be quiet while I record the episode, but you know how that goes. So anyway, uh, for those of you who are over at Geek News Central, if you don't mind, please do go check out my show. You can do so online over at quicksurf.com. Also, go over to Geek News Central. You can find out all of uh, the uh, links and everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes at both places. And, um, you know, as always, both shows, Geek News Central and uh, The Geekinator, are both uh, proud members of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. Uh, so anyway, with that being said, I know Todd usually opens with a little bit of you know preliminary chit-chat. Um, so in addition to uh, you know just kind of having a just terrible weekend for doing the show, um, you know a bunch of family stuff going on and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, Sunday evening, um, I went and saw the uh, Transformers Age of Extinction. I've been trying to get <laughs> go see it with my dad since it came out, and he's finally just like, eh, well, you know what, I'm not that interested in seeing it. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to go see it. So uh, went and saw it. Man, that is <laughs> one long movie. They could have easily cut 45 minutes to an hour out of it, and it would have still been a perfectly fine movie. Um, uh, yeah, it just, it was very long. It, it wasn't, uh, it was better than the last two movies, about on par with the first movie. So uh, kind of, so that was a little refreshing. However, uh, yeah, way too long. Um way too way too busy just oh man it was just there was a lot going on there they could have really simplified it and streamlined it a lot um anyway so went and saw that i thought it was all right i'll probably end up buying it on disc when it comes out but uh you know that was that was essentially my weekend and then today was uh uh you know basically uh today's monday 
So, you know, getting back into the swing of things for the week. So let's uh, go ahead and get into some of the cool stuff that I've got for this episode. Um, the first story is over at Mashable. Um, I ran across this. Nokia and Microsoft are possibly working on an Android-powered Lumia, which is weird because Nokia has, for their Lumia line, has really mostly been Windows. I mean, when you, when you say Nokia Lumia or Nokia Lumia, uh, you know, what do you think? You think, oh, it's Windows Phone. Well, you know, and Microsoft bought Nokia, which kind of, you know, makes you wonder what they're thinking uh, simply because it's still, you know, it should, you would expect it to be a Windows phone. Well, so I, I don't understand this and I'm a little confused. It could be an Android phone, uh, the next Lumia smartphone. So... You know, they've both previously released Android-powered devices, notably the Nokia X, the non-Windows phone version of its flagship Lumia line, would be a first for Nokia. Um, this new phone, and I'm using air quotes here for those of you who are not watching uh, the video here, the new Lumia will supposedly be released under the Nokia by Microsoft brand, according to EV leaks. Um, they've been spot on for past leaks, so, you know, it's probably, you know, pretty reliable, but still, I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, what's going on, you know, uh, you know, and this is along the same vein with Samsung doing the Tizen platform, but then they still keep, they essentially have their own fork of Android, and, uh, it, it just, it's, it makes me wonder, you know, what really they're planning to do. Um, but, uh, should be pretty interesting to see what comes of it. You know, at the end of the day, you know, time will always tell what Microsoft and Nokia are really planning to do. I was always somewhat confused, uh, about Microsoft buying Nokia. I mean, I know Microsoft has been wanting to get into the hardware business and emulate Apple and largely what Google is doing. But, you know, Nokia has been kind of one of those weird oddball brands that they, that they never really kind of grepped, you know, what, what uh, you know, doing the hardware, software, all-in-one thing. Uh, they've never really, you know, they were leaders of phones back in the day, but they've really, a lot like Blueberry fallen, or Blackberry, fallen uh, by the wayside. So, uh, not Blueberry. Blueberry is awesome. <laughs> uh, fallen by the wayside. So it should be pretty interesting to see what comes of it. From Tom's Guide, uh, Home Depot launches a Wink Smart Home Collection. I'm actually not that familiar with Wink. I, I, I realize that uh, Wink is one of those um, uh, home network appliances that are, you know, it's a collection of home network appliances that you can control, you know, light bulbs, that sort of thing. Um, as of July 7th, uh, Home Depot is to have a series of Wink-enabled connected appliances such as light bulbs, window shades, water heaters, etc., etc., uh, for sale at the retailer's 2,000 U.S. locations. So I may actually go to Home Depot and check this out. I've never heard of Wink before. Um, I've I've not really in the past been huge into hope, at least not for in a few years now, been into home automation simply because I primarily rent and you can't really do a lot. <laughs> so, uh, but just in terms of a technology platform, this does look pretty intriguing. So I'll be definitely checking this out. Uh, should be pretty cool. And, and for those of you who are uh, Wink users, um, you definitely should be checking this out because now you have some place that's probably pretty local um, to uh, get your stuff. No thanks. Why does this keep doing this? All right, I'm having some technical difficulties here. From uh, PCMagazine.com. I don't want that ad. Thank you. Can't stand websites that do that. From PCMagazine.com, uh, Google's founders are uh, eyeballing a fully reasoning AI. Now, this is kind of the holy grail. I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetimes, although there's been a lot of advancements, quite frankly, 
you know, not enough advancements. There have definitely been huge advancements in specialized AI. And when you read through the story, it's really not general purpose AI that they're eyeballing. It's really they're trying to tie it into their smart car, their self-driving car, if you will, and AI to do that. That I think that we can crack that nut. Um, you know, there, like I said, if you specialize, you know, and have a defined problem set and you can get some specialized AI in there, you can actually get artificial intelligence that's very good at what it does and does it way better than humans ever will do it on their own. But uh, in terms of general AI, I think we're a long ways off, you know. There are areas where that uh, we could do it, um, you know, if it's specialized, but that's about it. So, you know, the, the, the article points out that a big area of focus uh, is the self-driving car. Again, you know, this, they started off with the, their eyeballing AI, and I was like, ooh, AI, general purpose AI. And it, w it wasn't until I started reading the story that I was like, well, this, they're just trying to tie in their car. They've been doing that for years. You know, come on, guys. So should be pretty interesting. The next story we have is uh, from Mashable again. Um, this is kind of important, <laughs> especially if you're a uh, Android Wear user. You know, we're kind of in the early days of Android Wear at this point, seeing as it was just announced at Google I.O. what, a week ago, two weeks ago, something like that. Um, the story here, Android Wear bug is preventing users from installing paid apps. So basically what this is, it boils down to encryption. If you have a paid app, Android ties it to the device uh, that, that you're, you're buying it for so that you can't just go install it willy-nilly. Totally makes sense, it's, you know, makes sense. Unfortunately, there's a bug where the Android Wear device can't decrypt that app because it looks like a different device from what I understand. And so therefore, even though you paid for the app, in the Android Play Store or the Google Play Store, you can install it on your Android device, i.e. your mobile phone, etc., the platform that you bought it on, but it won't, and it'll automatically download the app for your Android Wear device, but it's encrypted with the key for your, not your Android Wear device, but for the, for the device that you bought it on the platform. You know, this is one of those things. Not, I'm, I'm disappointed to hear about this because it's something you should have thought of. But at the same time, it's one of those things that happens all the time. People, this happens all the time. It's, it's you just overlook it, and it's not until you get out into the field and you're like, oh, whoa, oh man, didn't even think about that. So if you have a free app, when the vast majority of apps out there for Android Wear are free, this isn't an issue. It's only four paid apps. Um, undoubtedly they, they're going to come out with a fix for it at some point, but, uh, still, you know, somewhat disappointing to hear about that sort of thing. Uh, you know, especially considering it's like, you know, these are paid apps, people paid to use these apps. They expect to be able to install them on their Android Wear device. From Reuters, FCC names heads of Comcast, Time Warner Cable, AT&T, DirecTV deal reviews, which is kind of interesting. So basically what this boils down to is a Federal Communications Commission's lawyer will lead the agency's review of the proposed mer merger of Comcast and Time Warner Cable, while an external lawyer will join to lead the review of AT&T's bid for DirecTV according to the FCC on Monday. Um, this is good and bad. It's good because at least, you know, it's a third party. It's bad because, you know, third parties are just as susceptible to, uh, you know, somebody internal. The same types of things that somebody internal is prone to, uh, you know, having bias and that sort of thing. So uh, I'm curious to see if, frankly, I don't think AT&T needs to merge with anybody. Um, I don't think Comcast and Time Warner Cable should merge with anybody. They're already large enough on their own. You know, we don't want, uh, you know, multiple large services out there. 
so, you know, I, I don't think they should, but again, that's my own personal bent. But definitely check the story out. It's it's it could have huge implications um, in terms of cable, TV, and cable and internet access and telephone access. All kinds of they're like huge implications here. So uh, definitely check it out. From PC World, wireless could come to more. I keep getting these pop ups. Wireless could come to more Arduino boards with Atmel Buy. So well, this story is basically Atmel has bought a wireless uh, company, um, wireless chip maker, Newport Media. $140 million is what they're paying for it. Newport Media uh, specializes in 802.11n and Bluetooth technologies. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, Arduino, the Arduino platform has sorely been lacking in wireless uh, technologies. You've typically had to do a shield to get that sort of thing. You know, I mean, I've, I've got an Uno here. Let me get it in focus there. There we go. I have an Uno here. Uh, our, you know, they, they've largely been uh, relegated to getting a shield like this little guy here for Ethernet. Um, there have been some newer Arduino boards that allow you to get uh, wired or wireless internet kind of built in there using ARM chips, which has been really cool. But uh, largely, you know, it's been something that's expensive to add on and it's not built in. And so hopefully with this buy in the future, there's gonna be more and more Arduino type platforms uh, as, as Atmel has kind of gotten into the internet of things and that sort of stuff, instrumentation, hopefully, uh, this will be something that's, you know, will become a lot more common. Um, from Gamma Sutra, Oculus VR has its own developer event. I thought this was really awesome. Um, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not an Oculus Rift user or developer, so I don't really have a lot more information other than that. It's an effort to directly foster their relationship with creators. Um, they're going to host a new developer-centric event this year, Oculus Connect 2014. It will be September 19th and 20th at the Lowe's Hollywood Hotel in Los Angeles. So if you uh, want to uh, go to that, definitely check it out. Um, I also have a story here over at uh, Port Clinton News Herald. I know it's kind of weird how I find all this stuff. Schools rewiring to close the digital gap. Uh, this is basically a story saying that uh, schools have um, gotten funds to to uh, to do uh, you know wiring to get better internet at schools because there is a large digital divide here in small Petaluma, California. We see that in the local just between the, the local schools. Uh, there's a couple of different school districts here and between each school district, you know, the, the funding that they get is is different and the, and the type of internet they have is different. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it's it'd be nice to, if, if we just kind of had a unity between all of them. And this article points out that even though it's getting better, that's not necessarily the case. I thought it was an interesting read and thought I would include it uh, for those of you who uh, want to uh, check in on that. From sciencerecorder.com, uh, there is an on-off switch for consciousness that has been discovered. This is pretty awesome. Um, some scientists were doing some testing with somebody who was epileptic, uh, just trying to kind of, you know, they were doing some probing as part of another study when they made this kind of accidental discovery. Um, pretty cool. It's basically an on-off switch. They think that it'll help a lot for people who are prone to... Uh, to all kinds of stuff in terms of uh, consciousness. Also, if you're doing any kind of brain surgery or, any, or that sort of thing, it'll allow them to basically, you know, shut you off so you don't feel anything. It basically makes you go unconscious. So definitely an awesome read. I, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details because it's, you know, still quite a bit more technical than, than my level of technicalness in terms of biotech, but I thought it was pretty awesome. From uh, VentureBeat.com, NASA's space robots will get the Google Project Tango smartphones. This is kind of one of those cool, interesting things. Um, 
Robots aboard the International Space Station are getting shiny new smartphones with 3D imaging capabilities, courtesy of Google's Project Tango hardware. Uh, Project Tango refers to the new line of smartphone and tablets Google is pushing that are more aware of surrounding areas and can capture a 3D image of an object or scene with a special camera. So this might not be that big of a deal, but um, that sort of thing can result in some pretty cool applications, especially when you get out into space. So NASA's robots are called SPHERES, which is Synchronized Position Hold Engage Reorient Experimental Satellites. Um, they'll use the Tango smartphones as a new set of eyes and hands to perform tasks outside the space station that astronauts usually handle. So coming July 11th, there'll be a cargo ship going up there in the not too distant future. Hopefully uh, we'll start to have astronauts. It'll become a lot less necessary for astronauts to take spacewalks or to handle things that these will start to be able to handle on their own. So I thought this was really awesome. You know, again, it's one of those things where a new technology comes up or is invented or is released and people go, I don't get it. And it's not until you start to see how it's being used where you go, oh, that's cool. So uh, should be pretty interesting. Let's see here, what else do I have? Ah, yes. Uh, last story of the evening. This I thought was really awesome. It's over at the register.co.uk. It's alive! Space hackers fire up zombie sun probes engines. The solar system's wandering relic of a satellite called the ISEE-3 is now back in action. Uh, a team of international space geeks has successfully fired up the engines of a long-defunct NASA satellite. Um, now they're going to try to get the bird into an Earth orbit that will enable it to carry on performing the mission that it was launched for 36 years ago. That's right, 36 years ago. This satellite is ancient. Uh, the International Sun Earth Explorer 3 uh, probe was the first spacecraft to successfully fly through the tail of a comet and was part of the Earth built armada that flew by Halley's Comet in 1983. NASA retired the spacecraft in 1997, but now, thanks to a $150,000 in crowdsourced cash and some inspired hacking, the probe is now back online. So they fired the A and the B thrusters and they uh, performed the spin-up burn. Um, everything looks like it's really cool. A little bit later on, they're gonna do another burn to get, get it parked into orbit. They've already got its primary uh, uh, instrument online, um, which is the, let's see here, it's, um, yes, the spacecraft's vector helium magnet, magnetometer, which was built in 1970, it has been restarted and it's already setting data back to Earth for scientists. It was originally designed to study the sun, and so now it's kind of back on track. NASA's gonna get a lot more data off of this, you know, 150K, you know, hey, that's awesome. So it should be pretty cool to see, you know, definitely read up on this. Uh, you know, it's cool stuff like that where you're like, you know, there's a lot of tech out there that if somebody is willing to just spend a little bit of time and money, they can really get into it. So anyway, uh, that's it for this episode of Geek News Central and the Geekinator. As always, everything I've talked about is linked up in the show notes. If you're part of the Geek News Central audience, just go to uh, geeknewscentral.com. It's all there. Um, if you are part of the Geekinator audience, go to quicksurf.com and check it out. It's all there. So with that, I will see all of you on the next episode for the Geekinator and for Geek News Central. Thanks for sitting in with me. And um, Todd, I think, has one more episode somebody else is going to be covering for him on Thursday, and then he'll be back to your regularly, regularly scheduled broadcast programming, etc. Uh, at that point. So with that, I will see all of you then. Thanks. Bye.